welcome everybody. We have an Ascension Sunday today, and our text is in the very beginning of the book of Acts. So, first of all, uh, before we'll go into the text itself, there are a few things that will be very interesting to notice. Uh, what it says, in the first book of Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given command through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, and so on and so forth. Okay? So the thing is here, from the very beginning, we know that this is the second book. Okay, what is the first book? Luke. Gospel of Luke. Great. It's good that you know. And this is not the first example in our Bibles that we have something like this. If we read very carefully, we can notice that we have pairs of books in the Bible. It's the first and second, I'm sorry. First and second Samuel is actually one book. Okay? In Hebrew it's called Samuel Aleph and Samuel Beth. Okay? So it's the first part and second part. So that's one book. First and second Kings is one book. Okay? So that's also uh, Kings 1 and Kings part 2. So we have this one. There is also a very interesting thing. Since people like in what we would call Old Testament times were kind of with, with at least these two samples uh, get used to two parts books when we ended up with four-part book, there was a special interesting thing done with that. If you will go into first, first and second chronicles, okay, that's obviously one book because it covers like one span of story. But then it's actually, you know, like, uh, plus we need to add Ezra, and Nehemiah. Okay? This was always considered to be one scroll uh, because they, they talk about the same theme, you know, same topic, same restoration of the temple, and so on and so forth. But since we ended up with one, two, and part three, what they did is very interesting thing. If you will go to the very end of Second Chronicles, to chapter 36, I believe. Yep. Second Chronicles 36. So, Second Chronicles 36, verses 22 to 23, last two. Okay. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdom, but also put it in writing. Thus uh, says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms on the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all peoples, may the Lord his God be with him, let him go up. Okay? Now, if you flip the page and you go into the book of Ezra. Read first three verses. So it's, it's, it's exactly the same. The reason is that people will know that this is part one and two, okay, everybody knows this is part one and two, but to make sure that they have connection between Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah, they basically made those two, or, you know, if they even, whoever put the, you know, markings on the verses didn't probably even notice that, so they even broke the verses differently, okay, but the text is, is totally the same. So when Luke does what he does, when he says, Here's the first book, and here's my after first book. Here's another book. Okay? That's, you know, that's the thing. He just follows the path of uh, previous biblical writers. 
Okay, just for you to know. So this is not something that he took from, you know, great, you know, Greece, you know, wise man, you know, or something. This is, this is normal biblical pattern. So, now, two things about this. Uh, the name Theophilus. Was it PH or PH? Okay, because whatever. Okay. Uh, there were, and still, there are discussions in the scholarly circles who this guy is. Okay? And the real answer is we don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and we need to learn it and be brave enough and courageous enough to say, it. if you don't know, just say, it. I don't know. Uh, instead of coming up with something, then, you know, that would be definitely, somebody will find out and it will be definitely a wrong answer. Uh, but the thing is, we don't know. Okay? We are in the book of Acts in chapter 1, in case somebody lost. Okay? But what we can say is, this is the word that stands for God. This is the word that stands for, uh, okay, love, but in the sense of friendly relationship. Okay? So it's a the one who loves God or the one who is loved by God. So there are at least three important things. First of all, it could have been a real person with a real name like this. Okay? Very possible. Uh, the person who is loved by God, I mean, yeah. There is another uh, interpretation that it is all of us, all Christians together, okay? Because all of us are those who love God and those who are loved by God, okay? Uh, there is a little bit more stricter reading on the first thing. And uh, if we will go into Acts, as I said, you know, if we are in, the, in Acts 1, what he says to him is, Ah, sorry, in the Gospel of Luke, we find the same name, of course, that's how we make a parallel. In Luke chapter 1, in verse 3, the way Luke calls him, it seems good to me also, having followed all these things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus that you may have certainly concerned the things that you have been taught. So there is a chance that he was actually a Roman official because most excellent is a title. Okay? So it's not only a person within the community, but it is, again, possibly that he was actually a very high-positioned Roman official within the community. And then Luke supplies two books. He sends two books to him. Uh, one talks about ministry of Jesus, and another one talks about ministry of the church. Okay? So, that's just some introductory thoughts. Now let us go into the book of Acts. So, in the first book of, of Theophilus, I'll dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Okay? Isn't this interesting that he doesn't say that I, in the first book, I dealt with what Jesus did and taught? Why he says began? Maybe because Jesus' teaching and acts 
of Jesus through the hands of apostles are carried in the book of Acts and are still carried through us in the world. Okay? This is what the, 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 the gospel of Luke was a presentation of the beginning of the ministry. Okay? But ministry didn't end with God's ascension. It still is carried out, you know, till the end of the days. Okay? So, and so I uh, began to deal with it. Until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So, remember that th this is the verse 2 is a very important parallel to what we actually have seen in the Gospel of John in chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. If we'll, in the Bible, if we can flip a couple pages back. Yes. We see that Jesus sends his apostles breathing on them. And what he tells them and what he charges them to do is, if you will forgive the sins, those who will confess, they will be forgiven. Okay? And if you will let those sins stay on them, if you will bound them with those sins, they will be bound with them. Okay? So what Jesus did before, remember this wonderful story when he forgives a sin and everybody like, who that might be, only God can forgive sin. So now all of this is done through his apostles. And that's why the Gospel of Luke is just the beginning of the story. And the story doesn't end, didn't end in chapter 24 of Luke's Gospel. It even didn't end in chapter 28 of uh, Acts of Apostles. It still carries on up today. Okay? So till the very end of his return, we will carry this mission. Verse 3. So he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Out of these appearances, we have only few. We have uh, the appearance on the first day. We have appearance... On the sec on, on I'm sorry, on the eighth day, so second, I would say Sunday uh, after, uh, yeah, second Sunday of resurrection, we have appearance in the Galilee. We have appearance to guys on the road of Amos, and so on and so forth. But even if we gain, if we find in the Gospel of John at the very end of chapter 20, Jesus did many other things. We know there are many other things that are not recorded. It should not shake in our faith. <gasps> so we have lost gospels and, and, you know, and there are other, you know, secret scrolls that only uh, available to only a limited group of, you know, disciples and so on and so forth. No, because the Gospel of John chapter 20 states very clearly, this, what we have, is written for us to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay? So what we have is sufficient. What we have is clear enough. And what we have is enough. You know, for us to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And he is the one who ascended into heaven. So, verse 4. Now, while standing with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. So while he was with them at the same place or... Uh, uh, yeah, or actually the verb can be translated as actually eating with them. So while he was fellowshipping with them, he told them not to depart from Jerusalem. And that's how Gospel of Luke ends. Remember, we, or I mean, those of you who've been in the first worship service remember, but those of you who will come, you will read it, you know. So it's, it's, it's basically, again, that's why I brought up an example of, uh, for uh, Second Chronicles and Ezra, so few verses they are they do not match word by word, but they overlap thematically. So he told them to stay and wait for the power from above. So he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, "You heard from me, for John baptized with water, and you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit." Not many days from now. So not many days from now will happen in 10 days. So one small chronological observation. Very short. We're not going to go into our main line. So resurrection. 40 days. Okay. 
that's 40 days. And then 10 more days with total of 50, so this, this is 10, and a total of 50, they will receive you know, flames of fire and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what does 40 days remind us of? What kind of biblical parallels we can come up with 40 days? 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years in the wilderness. Yeah, that's, that, that's an immediate one. The uh, Yes, the, 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 the water was raining for about 40 days. So we have flood. We have, yes, for Noah. Okay, we have wilderness. Christ temptation. We, therefore, building on that, Christ goes into temptation. And now we have another 40 days period. So what he tells them before an ascension, he kind of foresees in a sense or foretells them with this experience that they will go into some kind of wilderness experience. Okay? There, is, there are also at least two more important 40 days periods uh, in, within the wilderness. So before Golden Calf, uh, Moses was 40 days on the mountain, okay? And prior to that, he was 40 days, before that, he was again 40 days on the mountain when he received Ten Commandments, okay? An explanation for commandments. So this is his, this is very loaded with an idea of previous symbolism. So in a sense, before Jesus ascends into heaven, he charges them with the scripture, he tells them what, what, how to worship. He, he, he builds up this worship. And if we make a parallel of this ascension moment with Revelation 5, where Christ ascends into heaven and John sees, and he's actually told, oh, actually, there is a line of Judah. But then he looks at the altar and sees, he doesn't see any line. What he sees is a lamb, lamb of God. You know, So he hears one thing, he sees the other thing. So when we put it together, that's his kind of important, important point in the history. Ended and began simultaneously. And if we put the year of resurrection, roughly about 30 years, with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, we have, we have about 40 years of pilgrimage of the church. Okay? So the church was wandering through the spiritual desert, and had to figure out some of the important issues. Okay, so this, this 40 days is very, as I said, you know, very loaded in symbolism and uh, with the, you know, Old Testament background. So one more time. It's one big book, beginning with Genesis and ending in Revelation. Um, so, verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed in his own authority. But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to in the ends of the earth. Usually people concentrate immediately on that, you know, verse 8. You will be my witnesses, you'll go, you know, goodness knows where, and we send missionaries, and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has missionaries, I believe something like around 90 plus countries, uh, which is great, but let's kind of stop for a little second and then actually take a couple steps back. So what did, what do they begin with? Again, what's their question? What's the main concern? The main concern is kingdom of Israel, okay? Not even kingdom of God, not, um, I don't know, kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom of Israel. Remember what those James and John asked for when Jesus third time predicted his death and resurrection. Finally, they were able to overcome an idea of death of Jesus. Okay, he will die, but he will rise again. If he will rise again, he will sit in his glory. So, therefore, James and John thought, we should ask him. Can I be the prime minister and I can be the minister, I don't know, of finances in the kingdom of heaven? You know? And, and everybody got upset with them. Why do you think everybody got upset with them? 
I don't think they got upset because they asked for, but I think they got upset because they asked first. first. <laughs> they just, you know, were smart Alex, you know, who figured it out and decided, okay, if that's actually going to be so glorious, we might have, you know, chair right next to this guy, okay? So the thing is, again, in their mind, they are still in the idea of establishing the kingdom of Israel. They are thinking in the terms of the past, which is not necessarily bad, okay? We do not need to always drop everything on the past and always create something new. We need to transform what we have from the past through present into the future, but we do not need to drop the past. This is, sometimes it is tricky, especially in the church. But what I'm going to, they are still thinking about Jesus is the king of Israel and they want to have the kingdom of Israel. Instead of that, what Jesus, through his apostles, will build, and we talked about this few Sundays ago and the last Sunday especially. Remember when Peter comes to Cornelius, the guy who was a God-fearer, but suddenly him and all his house, so the house is full of Gentiles, they are not really by blood attached to Israel. Suddenly, they have a gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So what we see in the book of Acts, we are not going to go through the book of Acts today as a whole, but just for you, when you will read it, what we see in the book of Acts is slowly but surely establishing this, this change of paradigm. How, kingdom, how people, instead of thinking about kingdom of Israel, turn into an idea of kingdom of God. And in kingdom of God, there are no uh, differences in the sense of membership. Not in the sense of order, but in the sense of membership. Uh, in the level of nationality, social and age status, and gender. Okay, it is not about the order, it's about membership. Because in some of the religions and some of the religious practices, people of different nationality cannot be accepted. Uh, people of variety of genders could not be accepted. And depending on the age or social status, you would not be accepted. Unlike this, knowing the promise that Paul writes in the letter to Galatians in chapter 3... You know, uh, where he says that there is no Jew nor Gentile, nor male nor female, nor, uh, uh, not, I don't think it's, it's uh, free, uh, free or, yeah, free or slave. Uh, so those parallels, uh, verses 26, 27, 28. We see how this is <laughs> fulfilled. And we see all of this in Acts, in the book of Acts, okay? We see this fulfillment when they first cross the border in the literal sense, when they go outside of Judea and they begin to work with other people who are not connected to Israel whatsoever. Like two Sundays ago, we talked about the uh, Ethiopian eunuch who was... At, at the Feast of Pentecost, but who was not connected to Israel, okay? Then we talked about Cornelius. So they are kind of breaking borders. Then they, they're going and breaking some social borders because, uh, again, with Cornelius, for example, his house was full of his members, uh, his house was full of his house members, you know, his family members, but also his friends, and that's what we have in the text. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit came upon all of them. We can presuppose, and probably we should presuppose, that there were some women there, and maybe some children. And all of them have been baptized. Okay? So, all of three levels of uh, nationality, gender, and social, like age, mostly status, have been dealt with within the book of Acts. And at the very end, in the book of Acts, if you, we want to go there... Chapter 28. That's what Paul ends up with. Twenty-eight, twenty-eight. 
So, kind of like a context. What happened before is he is in his hotel room, sitting and waiting for the trial. And that's literally what happens. He, he was not in the dungeon. He was not in the prison. He was in the hotel room. Uh, he was able to freely, you know, meet with people. And this is very interesting. You know, think about social status of Paul. That it's not him going to meet with guys who are in charge of the Jewish community in Rome. Okay, in the imperial capital, there is a Jewish community. And these guys, the leadership of these guys, come to him to talk to him. Okay, I don't know. Probably for us, it does not really make big difference. For them, it was big difference. The one who sits at his place is much more important than he one, that, that the one who goes to someone else. Okay? So they really respected Paul, and when they said, you know, we've heard many different weird things about you, would you mind to explain? And he gives them an explanation, and they began, began to argue among themselves. So he preaches them about uh, uh, Jesus as the Lord, and then, as a final notice, you know, verse 28, Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to Gentiles. They will listen. And then he lives for two and a half years. Yes? No, two years. Sorry. At his own expense and welcomed all who came and proclaimed the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and with, without hindrance. Okay? So notice the difference. The guys in the very beginning of the book of Acts asked about the kingdom of Israel. He was teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God. What do we know about Paul? Wasn't he Israelite? Oh, yes, he was. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, you know, circumcised on the eighth day. You know, we have those places in the Bible where, where he describes himself. Yes, he was. He could have, again, pushed for the kingdom of Israel. Instead of that, he teaches about the kingdom of God. Now, how is it happened? Now, let's go to the chapter 1 again and see this verse 8. So in the verse 8, we have a very interesting model. So you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, okay, and then to the end of the world. And usually, people try to trace what's going on, you know, how it is, un, you know, un unrolled or like uh, delivered or developed in the book of Acts. Whereas Jerusalem, okay, Jerusalem is pretty clear. Uh, the Jerusalem period is roughly from page, I mean, from page 1 or from the chapter 1 in the book of Acts till uh, chapter 7. Okay? With the murder of Stephen, it goes a little bit further. Uh, but in reality, we almost have no Samaria. And um, it's very interesting and tricky. What I would suggest is, yes, the first few, let's say, seven chapters are about Jerusalem. But then we go into the lands where we have mostly Jewish synagogues, okay? Wherever Peter goes or where Paul goes, he goes into a city, but he doesn't go into arena. Only beginning with chapter 17 in uh, Athens and then in 19 in Ephesus, he goes into the settings where there is a mixed multitude of Jews and Gentiles. So I would suggest... Chapters 1 through 7 are Jerusalem chapters. 8 through uh, 16 through about 16, uh, are about, in a sense, spiritual Judea. So because the, the main group of people who are addressed are Jews, even though they are in different territorial or geographical context. And then, beginning with chapter 17, to the end, we are in the again in this kind of mixed uh, setting, which kind of represents spiritual Samaria, because Samarians, if we if you know the history, is were those guys who were brought by a Syrian king into the northern part of Israel and mixed with a remnant of the first exiles who went into Assyrian uh, territory. Okay, so. Where is the ends of the earth? 
we do not have ends of the earth in the book of Acts. That's why Paul ends with a statement that now Gentiles will listen, that God will bring the news to them. Okay? So in a sense, in this uh, Acts 1.8, we are those who live at the ends of the earth. Okay? Just a thought. And then he said, verse 9, 10, and 11. Uh, then he said these things, and they were looking on, and he was lifted up, and the cloud took him from their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This is Jesus, who was taken up uh, from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So he will come back as he left. Okay, so that's why we wait for second coming of Jesus. Because as far as I know, nobody saw him return the way he left. So, uh, important thing. Why do we have two guys in the white robes? One of the idea why we have two guys in the white robes is because in the books of Moses, we have an institution that every testament or every word shall be confirmed by the two witnesses, two or three witnesses, okay? That's why we have two of them. So they two, two of them testify that this is what's going to happen, okay? Questions or comments? Okay. 